Coming for round two, two of three slash five, depending on how you count. Um, okay, so, so last time I tried to tell you something about what neural networks are, a bit about how they're used in practice, and what are the big questions. And it's time for some theorems, you know, time to do some real mathematics. Um, no, I'm kind of kidding. But, but I, I do want to kind of start to present things closer to what the cutting edge of theory for neural networks is. And really I'll present today kind of two aspects of you know, probably the most well-developed side of studying optimization with large neural networks. So this is sometimes called the kernel regime of neural networks. Sometimes it's called the linear regime or the lazy regime. There are lots of names for it. And um, it's basically the study of neural networks that are very wide but not deep and not trained on too many data points, as you'll see. OK, so, so my plan is I'm going to try to make all the lectures, including this one, self-contained. So I'm going to remind you of my notation for a neural network. And then little by little, we'll state some theorems, and I'll try to give context for them. And as usual, just stop me and ask questions if anything is not clear, or if you have a comment, or anything like that. OK, so, so first of all, let's just recall the notation. So in this lecture, I'm again going to study fully connected networks. So this was a network that started with an input x in Rn0. And we got from it the pre-activation, so-called, that's these ZL of x's. In the first layer, they were just an affine transformation of x. And this was an element of R and 1. The n's were the widths of the network. And the w's were the weight matrices. The b's are the bias vectors. And we produce these kind of pre-activations, z of x, one at a time by taking an affine transformation of the previous one. But except for in the first layer, we apply the nonlinearity sigma to every component of the preactivation vector z. So sigma is a function from r to r that we apply component-wise. And in this way, we produce what are sometimes called the vectors of preactivations in the hidden layers of the network. And we do this capital L times, L for the number of layers, until we have a linear readout. So the output of the network is z L plus 1 of x is an affine transform of sigma applied to the final layer activations, BL plus 1. And just to keep the consistent notation, RNL plus 1. OK, so that, that was my notation for what a neural network was. Um, OK, so, so it's not going to be very important, but just to make my life a little simpler in this lecture, uh, I'm going to turn off the biases. Okay, I'm going to set all the biases to 0 in my model. All the theorems hold with biases, but okay, there's enough indices and notation, as you'll see anyway. So, so I hope you'll forgive me for this fact. Um, and because we're going to use it a number of times, let me just explicitly write out what this recursion from one layer to the next does in terms of the components of this vector. So if I wanted to study the ith component of what happens in layer little l plus 1 and an input x, well, there are basically two cases. So there's the case when L equals 0. That's this kind of slightly exceptional first case. And this is the sum on j goes from 1 up to n 0 of w1 ij times x sub j. Right? That's just my linear transformation of x. And when you're in a hidden layer, you have to apply the sigma. That's the only real difference. And L like this, W L plus 1 IJ times sigma of Z L J of X. This is an L greater than or equal to 1. OK, so, so I'm just kind of telling you on passant more or less my notation. Uh, but I hope it's clear and you remember from last time. OK, so let me just pause for one second and make sure this is OK. Is this OK for people? Good. Very nice. So, so I'll hopefully keep this up for the whole um, time. And what I basically have in mind for the presentation today is to tell you about two aspects of studying neural networks in the infinite width limit. OK, so, so today the goal. So we're going to fix the input dimension. We're going to fix the number of layers in the network. We're going to fix the output dimension. And we're going to study what happens when you take the infinite width limit when all the hidden layer widths go to infinity. 
Okay, it turns out, as you'll see if you come for the lecture tomorrow, that there's more than one way to actually take the infinite width limit. Okay, there are mean field neural networks, and there are these NTK or linear networks. We're doing the linear story today. But okay, regardless, this is conceptually what's going on. And the role of these large parameters n, which are the widths, is something like the matrix size in a random matrix problem. You know, the, these matrices W, the weight matrices, which are really all that appear here after you remove the biases, are like large matrices. They're NL by NL minus 1 matrices. And so you can think of this as some large n limit in random matrix theory. And sometimes that's what it comes down to. OK, and we're basically going to have two parts to the story. So part number one is we'll see that at initialization, when we choose the W's at random, and remember, that's how you start training. You first select the W's at random, then you optimize them by gradient descent. We'll see that the function you get, this stochastic process, the function of x, which is the output of your network, converges to a Gaussian process in the infinite width limit. OK, so while at finite sizes, when you have finite matrices here, you have a rather complicated stochastic process, some random function from Rn0 to Rnl plus 1. It becomes rather simple in the infinite width limit. OK, so, so that's what happens at initialization. That'll be the first part of the lecture, really. And then the second part of the lecture is for training, all you have to do is linearize. I'll be much more explicit about that, but I just want to be brief here. The point is that as you take the hidden layer widths larger and larger and larger, okay, under some important assumptions, which I'll be explicit about, you can replace the whole process of optimizing your neural network, which was complicated and nonlinear in its parameters, but just the process of optimizing its linearization around the starting point of training. Okay, that's what people sometimes call the kernel regime or the NTK regime. Okay, whatever, if you've ever heard NTK. All of this will hopefully become much more clear in the coming moments. Okay, so, so, so that's kind of the two parts of the lecture. Um, and what I really want to start with is I want to start by understanding what happens at the start of training. Okay, so, 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 so really this is, um, let me see if I want to, I think this is going to be fine. Okay, so, so the first part of what I want to say is this Gaussian process limit and what in the world it is. So, so recall that at the start of training, We select the weights and the biases at random, but okay, we turn the biases off in this picture just to make the notation a little easier. So we're going to think of the weights, W, L, I, J, so these are the entries of the weight matrices, as being independent, and they're going to be Gaussian with a mean that looks like this, and L minus 1 independent. So, so here, the scaling with the previous hidden layer width, that's the usual random matrix theory scaling. If you want a large random matrix to have order one singular values, you know, you need to scale the variance of the entries like one over n. And the CW is an order one constant. It won't be obvious what the role of this is for a couple of lectures. Just think of it as one. It, you're not going to lose anything for the point of view of what I'm going to say here. OK, so, so really the first question I want to study is I want to say, look, we think of the input dimension as fixed. The number of layers is fixed. The output dimension is fixed. And when you select the w's at random, you get some interesting random function. And I'd like to understand what it is. And my claim that I'm about to make is that as you make the widths of the layers wider and wider and wider, it converges to a very simple random function, namely a Gaussian process. OK, I'm going to, in fact, basically prove that theorem for you. So, so in order to state the theorem, I, I want just a piece of notation, which will help me a bit. Um, I don't know if this is standard, but maybe it is. So, so I want to say, if you're given a function mu from r n 0 to r, and if you're given a function k, a kernel function, from r n 0 cross r n 0 to r, I'm going to write that a random function f is a Gaussian process with mean mu and covariance k. Okay, in case you've never seen this definition, if and only if the, the values I get by evaluating f on any finite number of inputs are Gaussian vectors. Okay, f is a random function, and they're going to have this mean and this covariance. So, so the vector you get when you evaluate f at some collection of points, f of x1 up to f of xk, is going to be Gaussian with mean vector mu at x1 down to mu of xk, and covariance given by 
k of x i x j. K for i and j between 1 and k. That's just my notation. Okay, is this okay? I want to state a theorem something converges to a Gaussian process. And it's hard to state a theorem if you don't have a notation for what a Gaussian process is. So this is my notation. Okay, so, so let me state the theorem. My plan is I'm going to write the theorem. And then it's going to probably take up until the bottom of this board. And I'm going to try not to erase this. I'm going to stop after. You can ask me questions before I try to prove it. But I'm really going to try to prove this theorem. If that's not true, I lied. I told you last time everything I say is a little bit of a lie. I'm going to prove the theorem modulo a much harder theorem. OK, well, such is life. Such is life. OK, so, so, so let me give a little bit of attribution. So as far as I know, at least, the study of this Gaussian process limit for neural networks goes at least back to Radford Neal in the early 90s. But then it was taken up by a bunch of people more recently at various levels of rigor. Some people are physicists. Some people are mathematicians. There's a nice paper of Lee et al. Greg Yang has some papers. Um, there's uh, some people out of Oxford, I believe, that have some nice, oh, I think that's how you spell the last name, some papers. OK, let me give myself a little bit of credit. I did some things about this. I won't even really tell you what I did. So it doesn't really matter for the point of view of this lecture. But lots of people have proved various versions of this kind of theorem. And it goes like this. So, so let's fix the depth of the network, as I said, and the input of the network, and the output dimension of the network. Okay, so, so we fix those three things. Oops, I forgot. We fixed one more thing. We fixed our favorite function, sigma, from r to r, which I'll take to be polynomially bounded. I just, that just means it doesn't grow faster than a polynomial at infinity. OK, that's what I need from it. So, so the theorem is then the following. So then, as the hidden layer widths n1 up to nl go to infinity, it doesn't matter what the relative rates are, actually. The stochastic process is you get zl plus 1 of dot. OK, I fixed the input and output dimension. So those are at least fixed. You have some sequence of functions on the same spaces. They converge weakly to a Gaussian process, which is centered and has a certain covariance k l plus 1. That's my notation for the covariance after l plus 1 layers. OK, so, so i.e., the expectation, so the mean vanishes. If you take any component you like at an input x, this converges to 0. Actually, this is 0 exactly even at finite width, just because your weights are centered. OK, and the covariance between if you have any two inputs and you are studying the distribution of the output potentially at different components. OK, so you can take the ith component and the jth component of the output, and you can take inputs x and x prime. So this converges. So sorry, let me put the appropriate symbol here. I forgot it. So every component is iid. So you just have a delta ij. That's what this Kronecker product here means. You get iid copies in the output of the same stochastic process. And your, the covariance is just this particular function, which I'm about to explain what it is. Okay, so you have independent uh, output neurons. Okay, and finally, I have to tell you what the form of this covariance is. I promise I'm going to stop after doing this. Okay, so kl plus 1 has a recursion in terms of kl. So this constant CW appears, the variance of the weights. The recursion depends on this CW and on the nonlinearity sigma. So it's this times the expectation when you take draws from the previous Gaussian process. So you imagine that at the previous layer, you have some component, let's say the first component, which is a Gaussian process with mean 0 in the previous covariance kernel. And you would take the expectation of sigma of ZL1 of x times sigma of ZL1 of x prime. OK, so, so OK, and I need to give you the initial condition. And I promise this, this is the end. This is CW over n naught times xx prime. This is the value at two different inputs. x dotted with x prime. OK, so, so, so let me just pause for one second. That's like a lot to say and digest. And let me make some comments about what has happened. So, so you know, in a sense, the difficulty of studying neural networks is that 
they're compositions of relatively simple functions, but when you take compositions, it's hard to understand what ends up happening. But it's like in dynamical systems, you can think, I think it's a good way of thinking about it, neural networks. Every time you go through a layer, it's like time one evolution in a dynamical system. Okay, so just because you have simple time one dynamics, this is relatively simple, apply a nonlinear function and take a random matrix, it's hard to know what happens at long times. And so, so what this theorem is really saying is that A, when you take the width of the network to infinity, at, at least at a fixed depth, your stochastic processes you get are relatively simple. They're all Gaussian processes. And moreover, you have a dynamical system that determines the covariance kernel after L plus one layers in terms of the covariance kernel after L layers and the parameters of the problem, which are the thing that parameterizes the variance of the weights and the nonlinearity that you had in your model. Okay, that's kind of how it works. And okay, I gave you the initial condition. It's kind of the Euclidean dot product kernel in the first layer. So, so this is what seeds the recursion and gives you something interesting. Okay, so, so, so let, me, yeah, let me put this up, and then I'm sure there are some questions and comments about this, which I'm happy to entertain. Yeah. Oh. What do you mean n1 and l going to infinity? That's exactly what I mean. So what do you mean n1 and l going to infinity? So do you put them as multiples of a single rate? So it doesn't matter, actually. You can take the, the limits in any way you want. In any order? In any, in any order, at any simultaneous rate, it actually doesn't matter. Um, of course, the rate of convergence and things will depend on the rate at which they go to infinity. But actually, this theorem doesn't care about the, yeah, that's why I put it exactly this way. And that's an important point. I, I maybe should have mentioned that. Some of these earlier papers did things like take a sequential limit. You take the limit as one layer goes to infinity at a time. It simplifies the analysis to some extent, although sometimes it misses the main point, I think, this kind of thing. Yeah. So there's another, yeah. Are there any proofs that do, the, do it in the inverse way? So you start with a continuous system, and then you go back to the neural network representation? So. so the short answer is, so I think you're basically asking, what class of kernels can I get? Yeah, so if you say, OK, I have the dynamical system, because you can write neural networks as a kind of continuous time system, and then you say, I start with a, an infinite Gauss, you know, Gaussian process that yes. process on functions, can you then go back? Well, so it's not completely obvious, because your initial condition is always the same. So your question is basically, does there exist a CW and a sigma? such that from this initial condition, I can get to my fixed kernel that I'm interested in. That's kind of, and the answer is, I'm actually not 100% sure. I, I suspect you can get any kernel you want. I, in fact, vaguely remember thinking about that, but I can't recall which way it came out. So, so yeah, so it's a good question. I'm not like 100% sure in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, so, so OK, I, I was a little bit vague. But the point is, if sigma has, has k derivatives, that are polynomially bounded, then you get convergence in, weak convergence in CK. So, so you, you kind of get as, many, as much convergence as you can hope for, given the regularity of the process that you start with. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a physical significance to uh, keeping N0 and L, N L plus 1 fixed while letting all the other Ns go to infinity? So, so look, the, the short answer is I could lie to you and say yes, or I could lie to you and say no. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, he, here's my best argument for why this is sensible. You know, someone comes to you with a data set. And that means that determines the n0 and the nl plus 1. I mean, at least on the face of it, you know, the n0 is the dimension in which my inputs live, and nl plus 1 is the dimension of the outputs. So I don't really get to choose that. What I really get to choose is capital L and the nls and the sigma and all of that. And so here, somehow, the situation is that I fix the number of layers I'm going to take, and I just increase the number of parameters in my model by just making the widths larger and larger. It's some way to have more and more flexibility in the model class. So the, so the n1s to nls are really, sorry, I, I get yeah, yeah. These are really the dimension of the parameter space of the neural network architecture. Yeah, co correct. So, so, so more precisely, you know, the, the matrix, maybe I'll write it here and then erase it, right? So WL is an nl by nl minus 1 matrix. And so, so y y the short answer is yes. By increasing the n's, you just increase the number of parameters in your model. Where is the or does the dimensionality of the model itself enter anywhere here? So can you, can you say that, oh, look, I have a 
in my neural network, I'm putting in a high dimensional model to create, to predict outcomes, and at the dimension of the model, the parameter space of the model, which of these ends would be the, would record the dimension of the, of yeah, yeah, there's, the so right, so it's a good question. There's basically two ways to try to measure the size or the dimension of the model. You could try to measure a number of parameters, and that turns out to be basically irrelevant here. It's more like just the dimension of the vectors in which you represent your data. You know, these ends are really just kind of like, effectively, how many features you're extracting at every layer. Let's see, in my mind, that would be a, like, to every feature or every x or every explanatory variable, you would have a coefficient, a parameter associated. With it. Well, not not in the case where you're kind of hopelessly overparameterized and and you know non-identifiable. It's kind of so. So I, I, it's a sensible question. I don't know how to give really a sensible answer. That's kind of the truth. Yeah. Yeah, please. And do we know what happens if uh, some uh, width go to infinity, but the others can uh, Yeah, the short answer is you get a mixture of Gaussian processes. Essentially, the kernels self-average in all the layers whose widths go to infinity, but they remain fluctuating in the layers that don't. <sighs> I'm not sure it's written anywhere. Yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, okay, if, if you remind me, there's one paper to look at. I have to check what they have in there. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this is just a technical thing. So is it covariance converges to what they have a zero? I'm, I'm just saying the different outputs are independent. Yeah. But and is it prime somewhere? Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, I struggle. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, no, it ran away. Okay. So, 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 so. Thank you. Am I going to have to jump? I don't know if there's the stick. Okay, let's see if I can make it. As my, a different French colleague of mine would say, you have to defend your honor. All right, great. So that's what happens when you're short. You have to defend your honor by getting the board. OK, other questions or comments? OK, so, so, so at least I think at first people were a bit surprised. Neural networks seem really complicated, and they become rather simple. It's like you have a central limit theorem in some functional space. And so I'd like to give you a sketch of a proof of this theorem. But to do that, I, I want to tell you what the essence of the proof is rather than what all the details are. So, so let me start by telling you what the most important structural elements are of a, of a random neural network. Okay, so this is the structure of a random neural network. Okay, so when, when I say random, I mean the same thing as at initialization, when the parameters are random. So 99.7% .7 of all papers written about random neural networks basically use only three facts. Okay, so I'm going to tell them to you, and you will then be able to write your own papers. OK, so, so fact number one is very simple, but it's kind of fundamental. When you look at the sequence of these stochastic processes, which are these pre-activation vectors you get, this thing is a Markov chain. Markov chain. Right, it's kind of obvious once someone tells you, you know, that's the point of this compositional structure. And so, OK, that's very helpful because anytime you have a Markov chain, you can do a one-step analysis. Okay? So let's do the one-step analysis. OK, so, so um, conditional on the field at layer L, the field at layer L plus 1 is very simple-minded. Right, okay, in my Gaussian weight setting, um, it's very simple, conditional on I'll write it this way. Um, the field ZL plus 1 of dot uh, is just Gaussian. It's a Gaussian process with mean 0, first of all. Right? This thing, is ZL plus 1, is just an affine function with Gaussian, independent Gaussian coefficients of a deterministic transformation of this field. So of course it's Gaussian. You have covariance, you have mean zero, and you have a covariance which I'll write k hat l plus one. Okay, so so with 
So this is a good calculation to do. It's the first only calculation one needs to do, really. OK, so, so k hat l plus 1 of x x prime, the hardest part is to write the definition, and the easy part is to do the calculation. So this is supposed to be the covariance of zl plus 1, let's say the first component at x, and zl plus 1, first component at x prime, Oops. conditional on the field up to layer L. OK, so now you tell me. So you look at the formula. That's why I wrote these formulas for the ith component at layer L plus 1 in terms of the previous layer. And what do you get? Well, I mean, look, the only random thing are the Gaussian weights on the outside. And so you have to pair up the Gaussian weights and remember their variances. So we get CW over NL. That's the variance of the weights. And then you have to take the dot product of the two vectors you were dotting the weights with. Right? So this is the sum on i goes from 1 up to nl. Sigma of zli of x times sigma of zli of x prime. OK, is that OK? So, so let me say it in words, and then you can tell me if this makes sense. Because this is kind of, the, in, in, in a way, the most important part of the proof of this Gaussian process theorem. So, so you can say it this way, the field ZL plus 1 of dot, this whole vector that you have is a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian process, but with a shared random covariance, random covariance kernel K hat L plus 1. So, so each of the neurons, each of the components of this vector are IID Gaussians. That's Conditional on the previous layer, they're just IID Gaussians. The weights into the different neurons are independent. But they have the same covariance, which is itself random. So they're neither Gaussian nor independent as a result. They share the same variance. Okay, So that, that's really the structure of these random neural networks. And as I'm about to explain, if you look carefully at the structure of this conditional covariance, you see immediately why this Gaussian process limit thing is going to be true. But let me just pause for one second and ask if this is OK. Right, maybe it's, it's helpful to write it this way, right? ZL plus 1, the ith component, is just the dot product of the ith row of the weight ma matrix in layer L plus 1 with the vector sigma of ZL, OK, I'll write of x. Right, so when you, so, so of course, given ZL, this is just a linear combination with Gaussian coefficients, got to be Gaussian. And the covariance kernel is just given by taking the dot product of the vectors you're dotting with. OK, well, modified by the variance of the weights. OK, and, and to see if the different components are independent, you just recall that the different rows of the weight matrices are IID. So there's no correlations among them. OK, I'm going to stop. I feel that there's a question. I feel it in my bones. Yes, please. You just discuss again the, the role of sigma in getting this result. So, so, so this result here? Uh, oh, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna, to. So, so, so one of the beautiful aspects of this result is it holds for any sigma. But of course, the sigma comes into determining the recursion for the covariance kernels. So you know whether or not you can, excuse me, actually solve that recursion or say something sensible about it maybe depends on the sigma. So, so, so we're about to get there. But, but for now, these properties are so generic that they work for any sigma. I haven't said almost anything. Indeed, indeed. That's the basic reason why. I just need some moments to exist. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm talking about. Right. I mean, yeah, if you want it to be more greedy, you, it, just, it just has to be tempered. It has to be integrable against the Gaussian. Yeah. The mean zero has to do with the mean zero. Yeah, the mean zero just comes directly, even at finite width, from the w's having mean zero. So the expectation. So th that doesn't really change anything because you typically initialize the biases also to have mean zero. So I mean, if the biases didn't have mean zero, it would be a different story. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, then you would have a non-zero mean. 
I don't know what to say. But, but, but then, you know, shifting the mean of the bias is just like changing your nonlinearity. So you may as well put the mean of the bias into the nonlinearity, just like adding a constant to the nonlinearity. Right? And, and then just have, go back to zero mean. So in that sense, it's without loss of generality. One question, so do, do, uh, even despite the non-linearity of the sigma function, which, which is real LU, so uh, it's not smoothly dif differentiable, you have the Gaussianity because of the asymptotics in the layer size. Yeah, so indeed, so we're going to see that right now. So, 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 so let me, in fact, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew, okay, so I'm going to channel my inner Andrew. Okay, so, so let me just say, there's a third important thing. Okay, so, so what do you notice about the structure of this? conditional covariance. Okay, it's not just some arbitrary measurable function of the previous fields. It's very simple. It's actually the form of an average over the previous layer. Okay, and it has to be this way because your neurons are exchangeable. There's a symmetry there. It can't be anything but averages. And so, so, so somehow a key point is that this conditional covariance is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many functions like this. So I call them uh, collective observables. Is a collective observable, I used to use these terms when I studied condensed matter physics. Okay, so IE, you can write it in the form like this. So O for observable at layer F with some test function, sorry, layer L with some test function F. It's just the average value of F evaluated on the finite dimensional distributions of your field. So it's the same F, and you, for example, study it at some finite number of inputs. OK, my function f here is just sigma evaluated on the preactivation at one input times sigma evaluated at the preactivation at another input. OK, and, and in a sense, the key theorem that I alluded to, which is a harder theorem than the theorem I'm about to prove, but I'm going to share it with you anyway, especially because it got accepted for publication yesterday or two days ago or something, which is exciting, is like this. So, so, and this is going to be really the heart of the matter. So, so the thing is, these collective observables, they look like you should be able to apply a law of large numbers to them. Right? That, that, that's what you want to do. That's your first instinct. Okay, maybe your second instinct. Maybe your first instinct is to run away from all the notation. But, but, but it's a bit subtle because, you see, you'd like to apply the law of large numbers, but you can't have too much correlation between the sum ends. And so, so what turns out to be the case is that at fixed depth, the scaling of all the cumulants or all the centered moments, if you want, of these random variables is the same as if the sum ends were independent, although they're not independent. That's the scaling with respect to n. Okay, so, so the theorem goes like this. So for any such collective observable, the mean is, remains order one, even as the widths go to infinity. And the mixed moments of any number of them, so I take little q of them, let's say, and I take them and I center them, O, L, F, P. And I ask, how big is the resulting mean? Well, you get the same answer as if they were, if they, some ends were IID. So let me write it this way, N to the minus Q over 2 with the kind of ceiling function where I've written N for the minimum of the N1 up to NL. OK, that's like a familiar formula for some kind of stars and bars argument for the centered moments of IID sum ends. They're not exactly IID, but it turns out that they concentrate around their mean just like IID random variables. OK, so, 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 so let me now say in a word what I'm about to write carefully. Um, you see, as soon as you know that collective observables concentrate around their mean and the large width limit, what you recognize is that this conditional covariance, although it was random at finite network sizes, becomes deterministic at large width. And so yet you're in a situation where the process after L plus 1 layers used to be a Gaussian with a random covariance. So it wasn't Gaussian, nothing was independent. But this random covariance actually concentrates around its mean. And so therefore, you just get that this thing is just a Gaussian. There's no fluctuations. There's no randomness left at all. That's basically going to be the proof of the theorem. OK, so I'm about to do that for you carefully, but I wanted to kind of um, highlight it. OK, so, so, so let me stop for one moment. I'm just going to use these three facts and maybe some basic facts and probability. Yeah, that's a big O. That's a big 
It's, a, no, it's, it's just big O. But, but this is for any Q and any polynomially bounded Fs. That's kind of, so, yeah. Okay, so, so in particular, I don't have kind of sharp large deviations for these things, only on the, yeah. Good. Someone had a question? No, but just a remark. Oh. Well, it's, it's a particular case of uh, what we call this result. So you have a no, Gaussian martingale with sporadic variation, which is random, which converges to something deterministic, then the whole thing can be. Yeah, yeah, precisely. So, so, so indeed. OK, that, that's a good way of saying it. I don't use that language because I, I, it's not kind of where I come from. But, but like, uh, yeah, I, I say it in this way because I think this is all the structure you need. You know, it doesn't have that much. And, and so, so I know, I don't know if Lucia is here. Maybe. I can't remember what Lucia looks like. But somebody is working on the non-Gaussian version of something like this. OK, and, and indeed, you, you don't really need the Gaussian weights. Like, it's OK if it's IID, but not Gaussian. And, you know, same thing for you. You just, you just need these kind of covariance matrices to concentrate. OK, good. Excellent. So let me give you the proof now. OK, I'm doing well. Very well, in fact. Well, let me not say that, but I feel that I'm doing well on time. <laughs> OK. Good. Unless there are last minute. OK, very good. So, so, so let's try to prove this theorem. Um, the proof is very short. And I'm going to. Yeah, I'm just going to start it right here. And I'm going to erase as I come back. OK, so, so how do you prove that a sequence of stochastic processes converges weakly to something? Well, OK, there, there are various ways. But a kind of classic way is you show tightness, and then you show convergence of the finite dimensional distributions. OK, so, so, so I'm not going to talk about tightness, because we're in you know, proper company. Tightness is an exercise, pretty easy exercise in these assumptions. OK, so, so what we really need to prove is that if you give me a finite number of inputs to the neural network, then the joint distribution of the outputs converges to what I claim, the joint distribution of IID Gaussians. OK, so, so to do this, I'm going to use uh, Levy's continuity theorem, so, but I need a bit of notation for the inputs I'm interested in. OK, so, so let's fix a collection of inputs. I'm going to try to streamline the notation. So I'm going to write x sub capital A for a collection of inputs to the neural network, x sub alpha. Alpha goes from 1 up to capital A. Uh, and these are possible inputs to the neural network, which I fix once and for all. OK. And write. OK, really squeezing out all the space I can. OK, so let me just say, when I write ZL, I evaluated XA. I told you there would be a lot of notation, so I apologize in advance. OK, this is what happens in layer L. Neuron I evaluated on all these inputs. It's exactly what you think. So it's ZL, I of X alpha. Alpha goes from 1 up to A. OK, so, so my goal is to prove that the distribution of these vectors over i converges to that of IAD Gaussians with the covariance recursion that I stated. OK, so, so how do you do that? Well, to prove the convergence of these things in distribution, all I have to do is I can use Levy's continuity theorem. So I can just do characteristic functions. So OK, by Levy, we just need to show the following. OK, so so. Well, what's the limiting characteristic function of some IAD Gaussians? So it looks like this. Uh, it's just the sum over all the outputs. It's the product of the characteristic functions. And then I have the dual variables. I call them Xi m. So I apologize. I have to you know, introduce more notation. I don't know how to avoid all this notation in this context. OK, this is the limiting distribution. And this is the covariance matrix after L plus 1 layers evaluated on these capital A inputs I'm interested in. And I have to show that this is the limit as n1 up to nL goes to infinity of the, of the characteristic function of my fields. Right? Exp of minus i, the sum on m goes from 1 up to nL plus 1, 
of psi m dotted or transposed, if you want, with zl plus 1 m of x a. <sighs> Brutal. OK, so, so let me just complete the notation so that we can stare at it. So kl plus 1 a is just the covariance matrix. It's kl plus 1 of x alpha x beta with alpha and beta goes from 1 up to a. OK, so, so what I'm saying is for each component of the output, I have a capital A dimensional vector that I'm interested in. And then this is the characteristic function of all of them jointly. And my dual variables are the size. And I need to show that the characteristic functions converge pointwise to the characteristic function of products of independent Gaussians. That's kind of my uh, goal. right? Once you know this pointwise convergence of the characteristic functions, you get convergence to the finite dimensional distributions. OK, so, so, so let me just stop for a second. I'll let people digest. I'll let myself digest, too. Um, I'm going to, in fact, give this a name so I don't have to keep writing it. I'm going to call this thing chi for characteristic function, basically. Chi sub a. OK, that's OK. I'll introduce the notation down here. Okay, let me stop. Are there questions about this? Is it clear why this is what I'm trying to show? Okay, I, I want to show that this vector, Z, L, so mainly I'm interested in capital L, but I'm going to show it in every layer, evaluated a finite number of inputs, converges to a Gaussian. And so I'm going to show that the characteristic function of all of them jointly converges to the characteristic function of the associated Gaussian. So life's going to be good. Okay. So I'm going to do some erasing while you look. So, but I promise now the hard part of the proof is over. The hard part was to write what you needed to show. Once you know what you need to show, it's just one line, really. OK, three lines, modulo the harder theorem. OK, so let me attempt to keep going. You should definitely slow me down. Um, so, OK, so what do I do? I start with the characteristic function I'd like to compute. So let me give it a name, just so I don't have to keep writing it. I changed my mind. I'm going to call this star. Save me a little board space. OK, so star is equal to what? Well, I just erased it, but my neural network is a Markov chain. right? So I'm clearly going to do the one-step analysis on it first. So I'm going to write the expectation of the conditional expectation of this characteristic function of the outputs of the neural network evaluated at these xA's. So in fact, let me do this at general L. L plus 1, L plus 1. Very good. It doesn't much matter. It just makes my life a little easier. Right, so I'm going to condition on what happens in the previous layer. I'm going to integrate out the weights in layer L plus 1, and then I'm going to see what I get. So, so, so what's the point? Right? The point is that conditional on the previous layer, we already know the exact distribution of these ZL plus 1 of XA's. They're just IAD Gaussians, but with that random covariance. OK, so the characteristic function of some IAD Gaussians is just the product of their quadratic kind of characteristic functions. So you get minus 1 half the sum on M goes from 1 up to NL plus 1 of Xi M transpose k hat l plus 1a psi m. Right? The, the only difference, that's what I was trying to allude to before, between what I want to show and what's true, is that I have this expectation out in front. At finite width, at least, the covariance kernel that you have conditional on the previous layer is a random quantity. So I have to average with respect to it. Right? But here's the point. Right? So but notice that. The function that takes psi to this thing, x of minus a half sum on m goes from 1 up to nl plus 1, psi m. OK, I don't, okay. I'll write it out. l plus 1 a psi m. Sorry, I lied, not psi. K, for every, for every psi, 
if you give yourself a covariance kernel k, this is a bounded, is a bounded continuous function. It's true for any symmetric function, for any symmetric kernel k. And what do we know, right? What is this theorem, which I've tried very hard not to erase, telling us? Right? This estimate says in particular, so I'll call this estimate pound maybe, that any collective observable converges to its mean. Its variance goes to zero in the limit. OK, so, so I know, so pound implies that the limit as n1 and l goes to infinity of k hat l plus 1a, the actual fluctuating collective observable I had, just some fixed thing, you can apply this in every entry separately if you want, is equal to the limit as n1 up to n l goes to infinity of the means, whatever it converges to, k hat l plus 1a. And this is simply my definition of k l plus 1a. OK, so, so, so that's it. That means that because this converges to this constant in distribution, I can pass the limit under the expectation and just replace the k hat by k. OK, so this implies that I give it a name. I'm going to be lazy. I apologize. I'm going to call this star star. This implies this condition immediately. OK, so that, that's the entire proof that you get a Gaussian process in the limit. I haven't derived for you the recursion yet. But it's just the statement that conditional in the previous layer, you have exactly the right characteristic function, just with a random covariance. But your random covariance becomes deterministic. That's all you really needed. OK, so let me just stop for one second and ask if this is OK. And then there will be two more lines or three more lines to derive the recursion for the covariance curve. You happy, Yvonne? Yeah. Right. Have you ever been happier? <laughs> Maybe after France won. Yeah. You know, fair enough. But that's, that's a high bar, so. <laughs> you hope. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do some erasing, and I'll let people digest. People who are not Yvonne. Very good. OK, so how do you get the recursion for the covariance kernel? Unless there's a question or a comment. Are you happy, Mark? I should ask several people. More than, wow, OK. I'll take it. I'll take it. OK, so, so, so it's kind of, OK, it's as simple as that if you buy all of these arguments. So, so finally, let me show you the recursion. It's almost trivial, like all things that I know how to do. OK, so, so by definition, this kernel was the limit as n1 up to n l plus 1 went to infinity of, OK, if you look actually carefully at how I defined it, it was the expectation of the conditional covariance. That's how I defined it. It's the same thing as the covariance, but it doesn't matter. I'll write it this way. The covariance of z l plus 1, let's say 1, at x zl plus 1, 1 at x prime given zl expectation. OK. That was my definition of this thing. And I want to show that it satisfies this recursion that I have up above here. OK. You do the only thing you can. You just plug in the definition for the z's. You integrate out the weights in layer l plus 1, and you let the chips fall where they may. Okay, so this is the limit as n1 and l plus 1 goes to infinity. So we've already done this, right? We have a formula for the conditional covariance in layer l plus 1 given layer l. And so this is just cw over nl. The sum on i goes from 1 up to nl. Sigma zli of x. Sigma zli of x prime. OK, so, so now every neuron in this elf layer, although they're not independent, they're certainly identically distributed just by symmetry. So I can take the expectation and I can just take it, let's say, of the first term. OK, so I get the limit. Now I'm going to sneakily drop the last nl plus 1. Or I guess I didn't even need it before. It doesn't matter. 
and L goes to infinity. I get CW, and then I get the expectation of sigma of ZLI of X, sigma of ZLI of X prime. Very good. OK, and now the last thing is to just apply the theorem we just proved, but in the previous layer. Right now, we've gone from layer L plus 1 to layer L. And again, we know that as n1 up to nL goes to infinity, the joint distribution of any finite dimensional things at the previous layer converges to the right Gaussian process. Okay, so you just get Cw and you get the expectation with Zli drawn from this Gaussian process at the previous layer now of sigma of Zli of x, sigma of Zli of x prime. Okay, and that's the recursion. Very nice. Very, very nice. So, okay, let me stop. That's the end of this analysis at initialization. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to present it is that even if you don't care for or didn't follow or think I, you know, overemphasized some of these gory details, um, I, I hope that kind of the high level picture of what's going on shines through. You know, you have just this relatively simple Markov chain. The one-step transition kernels are pretty simple IAD Gaussians. And the difficult part is just to be able to kind of actually analyze what happens for more than one step. That's like the usual thing in Markov chains, I feel like. OK, and you can imagine this will be a preview for lecture four if you survive that long, if I don't totally scare you away, that if you want to do the long time dynamics, if you want the depth to go to infinity, something complicated might happen. Right? The long time behavior of Markov chains is kind of subtle. So, so, so let me just pause and ask for questions and comments on the proof of this theorem. So, so not on the proof, but just to understand yes. the result. Yes. So what, what you have just shown us is that uh, when you uh, start your network randomly, when, the, when these weights are uh, Gaussian uh, random variables, uh, then the last composition, so the, 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 the ZL plus 1, is essentially Gaussian. Yes, at least at infinite width. Okay. Yeah, so, 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 so if you don't let the number of layers grow, the number of layers is just fixed, and you just make it wider and wider and wider, then at the start of training, when you ask what's the distribution over functions that you get, it gets closer and closer to a Gaussian. What is the significance of this? Like, what does this theorem tell us? So, so apart from the mathematical. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 okay, so it tells us two things. So, so thing number one that it tells us is that although I didn't emphasize it, that I secretly set it up correctly. Now, I, I don't mean that in a kind of glib way, but if you just look at the way I initialized the network, you know, I carefully chose to scale the variance of the weights in a certain way, for instance. And if I hadn't done that, then you would not get a kind of, any kind of reasonable initialization of your neural network. So this is, if you want, a validation of the fact that this is a good way to initialize your neural network. And in fact, that if you don't do this and you just try to add more parameters by making it wider and wider, your network is just going to diverge. You're not going to get a Gaussian process at all. You're going to get like plus infinity. So if you start, if you set up the problem correctly, the final composition is very nice. Yes, cor nice. correct. So that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, and re really, the second thing is, OK, let me say two more things. Thing number two is that it's nice to connect the things we know. Like, there used to be like Gaussian process regression, and it's still very popular, and there was like an interesting, you know, rich non-parametric thing to do. And then there was another non-parametric thing to do, which is use neural networks. And it turns out that, that one somewhat degenerate limit of neural networks is Gaussian process regression. So, so if you want just a connection to something you already know, I think that's kind of important. Um, and the last thing which I'm about to get to right now is that this is the tip of the iceberg. It turns out that not only at initialization, but for the whole of training, neural networks just look like they're simple linear models. So you know, if you had a linear model and you had Gaussian weights, of course you have a Gaussian process at initialization. And it turns out that for all of training in this kind of regime, we're going to have a linear model for optimization. So it's kind of some part of like a consistent story. Yeah. Where is the sample size here? So which of these ends would be the, so what is the size of the sample? So right now there's no training. You, you see, so this is just convergence of stochastic processes. But we're about to do training. But there, I have to have a fixed, any fixed number of samples is fine. So you, you will not let the sample size? N no. I will, well, I want to, but the results will be false. <laughs> so, so I have to be a little careful. Constrained by reality. Yeah. So from 
not sure. I have to continue with this line of question because it's not very it's specifically for the decision. It's not very clear what's going on here. Because for us, the first like R and zero, so N zero is already lunch for us. Yes. And N zero, so this is the input data. Yes. The output data is also lunch, dimensional data, right? Yeah, but fixed. No, 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 no. But, but no, someone comes to you with images with a given resolution. And, and maybe the resolution is there's a million pixels. I don't know. But, but it's fixed. But, but your model might have a trillion parameters. Exactly. So, so you make it fixed compared to the number. Pre precisely. That's the right way to think about it. Yes. And, and the question is, because we have the same line of thinking. Yes. So the question is, okay, you have done it. You yes. Have, uh, yes. Given fixed apps, but in, well, yes. growing width. Uh, you get conversions. Yes. So, yeah, fine. And so, what is it good for? So, so what are you doing, like, with data gaps? So, 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 okay, so, so. Yeah, so, 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 okay, this is the start. So, I'm, what I'm about to present after this is what optimization looks like, starting from this starting point. But can you just give a keyword? Okay, you're getting a Gaussian and then. No, no, okay, okay, but fine. Let me, let me put it this way. Suppose you don't care about SGD, you care about Bayesian inference. So what I'm saying is in this limit, if you just do Bayesian inference with neural networks, it's just Gaussian process regression. Okay? If, it, it just connects it to something you already know. It shows that in this limit, neural networks are very simple. It's, it's just, you can just forget about the neural network. You just have a Gaussian process. So it's just, uh, so, uh, I'm just trying to, sorry. Yes? It, it, it's just a language. No, no, thing. yes. <laughs> I mean, it's just saying that this, this, that this is what you have if you just make the network. Like in practice, what people will do to increase the number of parameters is basically net make the network wider. That's just what you do. Now, okay, maybe you have a transformer, so you make more self-attention heads. Make the dimensions of the hidden representations bigger. You know, that's the kind of thing you're doing. And so, so it's, just, it's just to give you an understanding that at the start of training, the kinds of functions you start with, are like samples from a Gaussian process. You, you know, like, like if you remember to yesterday, there was this like difficult, it was difficult to understand, what, like it was important to understand where, on the, where neural networks start optimization because where they start influences where they end because there's so many ways to fit the data. And I'm saying this fills in part of the picture, at least if all you do is scale the width, then the starting distribution over functions is just something very simple. You just start with nice regular like Brownian motion type, like Gaussian processes. More regular than Brownian motion. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the rationale is, okay, if you have Gaussian weights properly scaled, that's what Yes. Happens. But if I have something... I know, I know, but I'm saying if you don't choose this scaling for the weights, yeah. like, you're not going to be able to do any optimization at all. So it's like a prior model in base. It's, it's a prior on the... Yeah, you can think of it as a prior. I mean, you tip, so if you do Bayesian inference, it's literally a prior. Yeah. But it's like, it's just numerically, like, if instead, if I just forgot to include the over and L plus one, I just had CW there. No, no, I understand that. Right? It's not a problem. So. I, okay, I'm a statistician. I don't care about all this. I can, I can try to have IID weights, which are stable. With ID yes, stable and pe people have done that, yes. With properly, yes. With properly yes. scaling. Yes. And I get something different. So what does it tell me? Okay, the initial distribution should be stable. Okay, so how about, so, so. So, so uh, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm not sure what to tell you. Yeah, I'm not sure what to tell you. Yeah, let, let, let me go on. Yeah, let me go on. I think that's the right thing to do. Um, and I'm going to, in fact, do it up here so that I can keep it. Yes, of course. In the limit, whatever, in the, in the whatever, Miles Temple approximate, or whatever, in the limit, whatever is your ability of the end represents, uh, uh, a, a neural network is essentially an random Gaussian function. So you can represent like a whole, whole bunch of these, uh, these things in the middle, the hidden layers. By one, so you have an input, it goes inside a random function, out comes an output. And this random function is what is, is, is a Gaussian. Right? Yes, that's correct. That's correct, yes. It just wasn't obvious that it was going to be so simple. Yeah, exactly. So it's an equivalent. It's, it's, so a complicated network in the limit has a nice representation as a Gaussian. Uh, I, th I, th I think that's a fair way of saying it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I think that's a completely fair way to say it. 
you can imagine the neural networks is to be able to, to learn from complex data, complex uh, things and so on. And so you can expect that if you uh, make the number of parameters bigger and bigger, there is a way you do so here by, uh, by yeah. thinking uh, with uh, bigger and bigger, you get something very simple in the end, so meaning that you are unable to capture no, but this is just at the start of training. No one said anything about optimization. I'm about, so I'm about to make your point for you. Okay. You, because you already secretly know the answer, of course. Okay. L let me state the next theorem. I, ha I have to do it because I think this will clarify much of this discussion. So, so I was just telling you about what happens at initialization. And you're, 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 the response of some people was, who cares? And okay, I mean, I need to know the initialization to be able to talk about training for what it's worth. But okay, regardless. So, so, so here's a theorem which I think will be much more likely to be well received, let me put it that way. So, so th there are many people who did interesting work here. I'll just cite a couple of them uh, for reasons that are hard to explain. OK, so, so, so here's going to be the theorem. It's, it's going to be making Yvonne's point in the strongest possible way. You start with a neural network, and you have this promise of learning interesting data-dependent features. That's what I told you about last time. And I'm going to tell you that in this regime, you don't learn anything interesting. Okay, that's going to be the rough statement of this theorem. But this theorem will tell you something about why optimization is successful. Okay, so, so let's fix the depth, the input dimension, to be greater than or equal to 1. I'm, for simplicity, going to take the output dimension to be 1. And I'm going to take my nonlinearity to be whatever I like. Let's say ReLU or anything else. Okay, and then I'm going to study optimization in which I minimize an empirical risk. So my loss L of theta, let's say, is mean squared error. So 1 over 2n, sum on i goes from 1 up to n, oops, little n, of the outputs on my training data set. So my training data set, someone hands me it and is fixed forever. I'm going to call the outputs yi today. And xi, yi are sampled iid from any reasonable probability distribution you want. OK, the x's are iid Gaussian. The y is the conditional mean of the x's, or the f, f given x is anything you like, essentially, as long as it's order one. OK, and we're going to do optimization by gradient descent, or really, I'll just present gradient flow. So gradient descent with small step sizes. And consider training by gradient flow. So we take d by dt, theta t. So I hope you don't mind. I'm going to put my t's in the bottom now today is minus the gradient with respect to theta of the loss of theta t. OK, and, and theta 0 is the random initialization I had before. OK, so, so I start, OK, I've erased it. I forgot it was right here. So I start just like before, all my weights are IID random. And then I just do gradient flow on the empirical risk on a fixed data set. OK, and I'm, and I'm going to scale the width of the network, but the number of data points won't change to your question. Um, and the depth won't change. OK, so, so then with high probability, so here with high probability both over the samples of the training data and over the initialization, as long as the hidden layer widths are big enough, and there are a variety of papers, but they all have to be polynomially large in the sample size you have the following kind of phenomenon. OK, so first of all, optimization will be successful. So this is kind of one of the cool things in this regime, that you can actually prove this first kind of big question I had uh, last time, which is that the loss goes to 0. You actually fit the training data. So that's kind of nice. OK, and let me write the second one here. Ooh, actually, I can write it here. No problem. Let's start writing it here. OK, and the entire trajectory of training, so the supremum over all times of, tra of your actual training trajectory for the parameters that you have, is going to be the same thing, and I'll, I'll be very precise about this on the next board, as training the linearization of your model. OK, and the errors, depending on the situation, are polynomially decaying. So n to some negative power where n, again, is the minimum of the hidden layer widths, okay, where the most interesting thing is what is this theta t lin. So this is going to be training the linearization of your model around the start of training. 
OK, so, so I first linearize my model around theta 0. So by definition, it's the predictions I have at initialization plus the gradient with respect to theta at initialization dotted with theta minus theta naught. So it's quite literally, I'm saying that this is the linearization of your model around the initialized value of parameters. OK, and then what you do is you say d by dt of theta t linearized is nothing more than negative gradient flow with respect to your same empirical risk, but now on the linearized model. OK, so, so what I'm saying, and this came as a big surprise to people, and I hope this clarifies a little bit what I meant by this Gaussian process thing is the tip of the iceberg for how these models are simple, is that you thought you were training a complicated nonlinear model. That's what all these AI crackpots were trying to sell you on. You're learning interesting features. Mm, that sounds great. But actually, OK, interesting, there's this very simple regime, seemingly very benign, where you just fix everything but the widths of the network, and you let the widths grow and grow and grow and grow. And what you find is that your entire trajectory of optimization is getting closer and closer and closer to what happens if you had just linearized your neural network around the start of training and just had done gradient flow on the linearized model. OK, so, so the moniker here is that there's no feature learning. This is just the, that's why they call it the linear regime. Feature learning, you're just equivalent to a linear model. Yeah, please. When you are linearized uh, low, yeah. the L also So do you take the inside the definition of the L? Yeah, so, so all you do is you replace Z by Z linearized. OK, okay so same training data. That, that remains the same. Same initialization. That remains the same. You just you know, train a linearized model. So if you want to think geometrically, you have some space of models, which is curved. And you could either move along the curved space of models, that's the true optimization, or you could move along the tangent space of the space of models, that's the linearized optimization. And the point is, they're the same. Okay, that's why they call it the kernel regime. Okay, there's an underlying kernel, which is just the kernel that underlies this linear model. At time t. Yes. Well, I mean, the way I'm doing it is you're kind of doing full batch optimization. So every step uses all the samples. You know, it's just you kind of keep doing them. But you, you could equally well imagine that each time you observe one sample and you use it to take a stochastic gradient, you, you'll get the same result. Yeah. So, where's yeah. so, 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 it's so, OK, it's both important and not important. So, so as, as you're about to see, OK, I have plenty of time, hopefully, to tell you that you need a little bit of non-degeneracy on your training data because the NTK, which is the kernel that underlies this linear model, just needs to be strictly positive definite. And so, so and it basically is, OK, except when it isn't. You know what I mean? So I just need a little bit of randomness on the x's. Uh, I'll, I'll try to say that kind of in a more serious way. Yeah. Uh, one question. Yeah. So, since the key to training anything on a computer with big data is not to use all of it at the same time, are there any regularity conditions on the shrinkage of the learning rate for the stochastic gradient that the that, that you the same correlation is on? Yeah, so that's a great question. The short answer is yes. So so maybe let me say this is this is a, a regime which is convenient to study mathematically as a starting point. At least you understand what it means to train a linear model. But it's a little sad because it misses the point of what neural networks are supposed to do. And virtually any deviation from the setup of this theorem will cause you to leave this kernel regime. So if you take very large aggressive step sizes, you will no longer be equivalent to a kernel method. If you scale the data set size with the model size, you do it non-parametrically in this way, you're not going to be a kernel method. If you let the depth grow together with the width, you're not going to be a kernel method. So if you change the initialization, that'll be the, the lecture tomorrow. You can have mean field dynamics, and it won't be a kernel method. So, so, so yes, there's many ways to kind of get out of this regime. Often 
for example, if you shrink this step to aggressive event, then you will not have the time to arrive at the, at the global optimum rate. So, so, okay, fair enough, but this will still be true. It's just your linear model won't have time to arrive at the global optimum either. It, yeah, Th this is only if you do something sensible, if you keep the learning rates like order one in the appropriate units, yeah. What is alpha? So, so alpha depends on the assumptions on what norm you put here, first of all. And it depends a little bit on the assumptions on the kind of network. But sometimes alpha is a half, sometimes alpha is an eighth. It just depends on what techniques people. So, 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 but, but it's not very important conceptually. My point is you're just close in any kind of sensible sense you want. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so my goal for the rest of this presentation is I just want to tell you how to think about this result. I'm not really going to prove it. Um, I'll, I'll try to draw some pictures and, and I'll indicate how the calculations go in the very simplest case of one hidden layer. So this, this last line that you wrote down, no feature learning, yes. is a, a word of caution? Like, well, how do we interpret this? Like yes, yeah, so, so, so the way I would interpret it is this limit of neural networks is one which misses the important practical aspects of what neural networks are doing. You know, it's kind of like imagine you're doing a, some kind of non-parametric statistics problem, but you fix the model size first and you let the data set size go to infinity. And then you think about what happens when the model size goes to infinity. Well, you're going to miss important aspects of the interplay as the model and data set size grow together. So th this is a well-defined limit of training neural networks, but it, it misses the important things that neural networks really do. So this is kind of like, uh, uh, yeah, it's an interesting limit, but it's not the one that actually is going to capture anything about feature learning, transfer learning, whatever. That's kind of what I would say. So what would change for, in the next theorem or next result you give us? What would change for you to claim that, look, there is, we are learning something? So, so, so for me, like almost definitionally, there is feature learning if you're not equivalent to any linear model. That's, I mean, you know, you could haggle over whether that's a reasonable definition, but I think that's a is potentially reasonable definition. Yeah. Um, right. So, so yeah, we'll see like tomorrow that if you change the scaling a little bit, you do something which is like Wasserstein gradient flow, basically related, kind of like optimal transport. That's the kind of dynamics you get when you think about things in the right way. And okay, those things are not linear in any manner. Although it's hard to analyze them. They're kind of complicated. Yeah. So, so Zlin is what generates theta lin. What I'm saying is you have two models. You have your real neural network that you can train. And you could initialize your neural network, linearize it around initialization, and train that. That's Zlin. And I'm saying the entire trajectory of how the parameters evolve in Zlin and, 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 and Z are the same, or they become closer and closer. So, so your, your neural network becomes closer and closer to its linearization, i.e. it becomes a linear model in the infinite width limit. Yeah, yeah, so the, the L function is the same, but indeed, when I say lin, I mean, you know, you take the, you, you plug in Z lin instead of Z L into, into the loss. That's right, that's right, yep. That's right. Okay, very good, very exciting. So let me think about what to present. Uh, this also yeah. tells why the CMT is important. Well, right, so, so okay, so, so, okay, fair, thank you, Giovanni. <laughs> so, so. I started off saying yesterday that one of the reasons to study, one of the important things about neural networks is to understand where they start optimization. And you see that at least in this kind of regime, everything is determined by where you start because that determines the linear model that you're actually optimizing. So in this sense, it is important to know what, like, that you have a CLT and any other properties you can get at initialization. I think that's kind of fair. Okay, so. Let me think about how to present this in the best possible way. Okay. Okay, I think we can do this. I think we can do this fine. So, so, so let me kind of dramatize what is supposed to be happening when you do this kind of theorem. So, okay, I'm going to explain the intuition for this kind of theorem in the simplest possible case. I think that's what I want to do. So intuition, when capital L equals 1. OK, 
Okay, so, so this theorem holds for any depth, but it's easiest to prove when capital L equals 1. And things are just a bit more technical, but ultimately all the same for any fixed depth you want. Okay, so, so here, I hope you will allow me to scale the model in the following way. I'm going to take out the variances of the weights outside. W2i sigma of 1 over square root of n naught w1i dot x. So in this way, I'm going to initialize the w1 and the w2 to be order 1 Gaussians rather than variance 1 over n. It's a bit simpler to write it in this manner. OK, and so, so what I want to understand is I want to understand why this neural network becomes close to its linearization. OK, that's the fundamental question. My claim is that as you optimize this network, it's going to look very much like its linearization around the start of training. OK, so, so just to be clear, w2i okay, at time 0, w1i at time 0 are going to be Gaussians with mean 0, let's say variance 1. It doesn't matter if I put 1 or CW there. OK, so, so what does it mean for a model to be linear? So maybe this is kind of the key point to emphasize. Um, well, z2, so let me put the thetas in here, because they're kind of the key things. Right? When I say the model is linear, I don't mean it's linear in x. I mean it's linear in its parameters. That's what I mean by a linear model. So, so what does it mean that this model is linear in theta? Well, just by definition, this is true if the Hessian with respect to theta were 0. Right? I hope you'll agree with me. A linear function, at least if it's nice and smooth. Linear if and only if all the higher order terms vanish. So in particular, if the Hessian is identically 0. Just get a linear function of theta. OK. Well, it doesn't look like the Hessian is going to be small. Or does it? OK, let's calculate. So OK, we have. So, so, so let's try to calculate the second derivative with respect to, let's say, the weights in layer 2 of the model. Oops, this is z2 of x and theta. OK, so, so we just fix an input x. Some input, let's say, from our training data set. It doesn't matter. And let's calculate the entries of the Hessian. So I have to take all the mixed second partials. OK, so maybe somebody can tell me, what's this partial derivative equal to? Here's a formula for z. Where are the so, so theta is just the collection of all the w's that I have. It's just, it's just my generic notation for all the parameters. Right, so the Hessian with respect to the theta is the matrix of all the second partials that I can possibly get. So this is the, maybe the simplest of all the second partials. So what do I get? Zero. OK, you can't fool Mark, unfortunately. I, I keep trying, but it doesn't seem possible. Right, you get zero. Why is that? OK, well, you get exactly zero because the model is linear in its final layer weights. OK, so, so it's already linear, even at finite size. OK, fine. Fine. So what about if you compute the mixed partial with respect to a second layer weight? And with respect to a first layer weight, so let me make the two inputs different, i and j of x and theta. What do I get now? Just the part with the w1 inside, no? Sigma. Yes, that's, that's true. So, so, so but, but notice here I have two different, potentially different components, i and j. So. OK, so, so, so let, me, let me write it out. Let me take the derivative with respect to w2 first. So this is d by dw1j of, I have 1 over square root of n1 times sigma of w1i dot x. I tell you when i is different from j and i let you. OK, you can't fool Yvonne either. OK, no, unless i equals j. No, 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 I disagree. You get a delta ij. They could be the same. No, 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 but that's important. That's important. The Hessian is not identically 0. You have a delta ij, and then you have a 1 over root n, and then you have something that's order 1, some kind of thing. 
Okay, and similarly, for the same reasons, the same thing is true if you calculate the mixed partials with respect to the first layer weights of z2 of x and theta. You again get a delta ij for the same reason. You, the different neurons don't interact with each other. And you get a 1 over square root of n1. And then you get something that's order 1. OK, so, so, so what have we learned? I claim we've actually done the most important part of the calculation. So what we've learned is the following. So the Hessian, with respect to your parameters of the network output at some input x, is block diagonal. Okay, so you get the Hessian of the first neuron at x and theta all the way down to the Hessian of the last neuron at x and theta, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, okay, where h i of x and theta is just the Hessian with respect to the parameters of the ith neuron. The w1i, w2i of z2 of x and theta. Okay, but each of these matrices we just checked is something that looks order 1 times 1 over square root of n. Okay, so, so each of these things is 1 over square root of n times something order 1. Okay, so, so what did you just learn? Well, you learned something a little unexpected. Namely, you learned that. OK, the operator norm of the Hessian is just the maximum of the operator norms of these on-diagonal blocks. But every single one of them is rather small. OK, so, so therefore, you learn that the operator norm of the Hessian of these networks is O of 1 over square root of n1. OK, so, so this is kind of the first main part of the intuition. Your neurons are only very weakly interacting. That's kind of what is not 100% obvious when you first look at it, but it is when you do this calculation. Uh, and they're weakly interacting in the sense that the Hessian is just dominated by these on-diagonal blocks, which is a, are a bounded size, and each of them are small. OK, so this tells you that your model is close to the linearization. OK. Yeah. You want to put up? OK. Everyone yells at me for putting different symbols here. So I sometimes don't put any symbol at all. That's, that, I think that's your version of a. <laughs> um, OK, so, so, so what we find is in this scaling, the second derivative of your neural network as a function of its parameters becomes very small as you scale the width. OK, but, okay, but the norm of the gradient of the neural network, z2, with respect to its parameters, and I'll let you check this. This is the L2 norm. OK? Is order 1 as you scale n. I'll let you check it. It's a sum of IID objects, each of which is order 1. Well, it's an average of IID objects. OK, so, so, so th this, in a sense, is the fundamental thing that's going on at finite depth, although it's easiest to see for these one-layer networks. Your model just doesn't correlate the neurons very much. You can move one neuron a little bit, but what happens when you move one neuron and what happens when you move another neuron is just not very strongly interacting. And so you have this model where the gradient remains order one, so you can make progress in optimizing your function, but the correction to just the linearization goes to zero. Okay, that's supposed to be the basic idea. So let me just stop and see if there are comments or questions about this, because I'd like to make a couple of comments, which I've alluded to a little bit, um, about how to escape this kind of kernel regime. Because again, people proved this, and they said, oh, this is amazing. Now we understand everything about deep learning. Okay, that's how machine learning people do it. They just do anything, and they say they've solved all the problems. <laughs> okay? And then people said, but wait a minute. You know, this is just a linear model. And they said, you're right. We understand nothing about machine learning. Time to write the next paper. Okay, pretty much like that. Um, so, so uh, okay. But for, for me, this is like just an interesting observation. This is like the wrong limit to take. This yep. explains the, I told, we discussed yesterday, this explains the Gaussian. Yes. Because since you're very close to the final transformation of the Gaussian, then you are Gaussian. Precisely. 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 Indeed. So, so, so I should have said that, and I forgot, so thank you. Yeah, w once you know that your parameters are Gaussian, but your Hessian with respect to the parameters is small, then you're just a sum of Gaussians. 
So it sounds like you're Gaussian. Sounds nice. Um, okay. I agree. Thank you. Yes. This has nothing to do with the previous result, right? It's, it's another statement. Well, it's, it's another statement. So, so you're right, but the kind of things you have to really do, although I didn't have time to go into it, is you basic, the, the way you prove this kind of result is you check things at initialization, like that the Hessian is small and that the Jacobian is order one. You check a bunch of things. And then you have to, you have to show that your Hessian remains small throughout training. So it's like there's two steps. One step is you have to do the analysis at initialization and say that your Hessian is really small and your gradient is really well conditioned. So that's like something about initialization. So it's a little bit beyond this Gaussian process thing, but it's the same basic calculations. And then you have to show that you don't have to move too far to fit your training data because you only have a fixed amount of data to fit. So, that, so that's like an extra step in the analysis that you need. Another question. Yeah. Do, will these results hold true if the layers themselves are of different sizes? Maybe there's some upscaling, but all of them grow simultaneously. At yes. Point. Yes. This, so this, just like the Gaussian process result, doesn't need anything about the rates. It's just you're going to be bottlenecked in terms of your rate by your smallest layer, which is kind of natural. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, so you could do that because now you know you start with the Gaussian process prior, then you use a kernel method, not necessarily the kernel of your Gaussian process, but it doesn't matter, to do the training. And you get a Gaussian process after training too. That's true. So indeed, I mean that's that's one of the things people originally wrote down when they kind of did this point of view on it. Yeah, for sure. So they they fit together in this way. Do you have a... I, I really <laughs> Fair enough. That's true. That's true. That's true. Indeed. So, so it, yeah, it's, you don't need just that the norm of the gradient converges, but the whole NTK, the dot product. So, you know, but but yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, so, 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 so need the theorem and, and this analysis, ultimately, the conclusions are the same for any fixed L. But the rate of convergence gets slower and slower as L grows. So the short answer is yes. And the slightly longer answer is I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> I, I know how to do the calculation, but I've never made it sing like this calculation. You know, this one is just like, oh, I get it. As soon as you write it down, I feel stupid for not seeing it 20 years ago, you know, or whatever. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure I'm getting what you mean about, okay, I'm getting back to some linear model because it's linear in the parameter, but not in the... No, but, that, but that's the definition of a linear model, is linear in its parameters. I mean, we always take a feature map, and then on top of that, we do a linear method. So, 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 so sure, you're going to have a nonlinear and x model. But, OK, you call it x. I call it phi of x. What's, what's a phi between friends? So, 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 so for me, linear is only linear in the parameters. That's all, that's all it ought to mean. So what you're saying is that basically you don't tell anything about this phi of x, this phi that's same synthetically when you look at such type. Yeah, pre precisely. It's, it's like the phi is independent of the data. Like it's just it's there. And therefore, it doesn't adapt to a data. And therefore, you didn't, you know, there's no feature learning. There's no data adaptation. That, that's kind of what I mean. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So coming back to your first result. So you said that one way of looking at it is that a random neural network prior converges to a Gaussian process prior. So I was going to ask, do we know anything about uh, model posterior? So suppose, you know, we did, uh, we, we just had a uh, Gaussian likelihood and, you know, Gaussian process prior is very much used in the Bayesian community because then you get a Gaussian process so so the short answer is definitely it's one of the things I've been working on the last couple of years me and uh, some other groups as well and so so it turns out if instead of doing SGD 
you want to do Bayesian inference. You just take a Gaussian prior in each individual weight matrix. You get some potentially complicated, I don't necessarily want to take this kind of limit, prior over functions, and then you have a quadratic log likelihood, and you ask what's the posterior you get. So in some situations, you can exactly write down what posterior you get in the limit where you know, the number of data points, the width, and the, and the uh, input dimension all go to infinity. So in this kind of interesting non-Gaussian process limit. You can write it down, and it's explicit, and kind of has some beautiful form, and you can analyze it, and so on. So, so we know quite a bit now about this Bayesian inference stuff, though, it's, though, though not as much as we'd like. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the short answer is actually no, in the sense that the results are, you can just condition on the data, okay, yeah. and the, and they simply the results tell you what statistics of the exact sample you have come into the posterior. And then if you have further assumptions on the data, you can then say something about the distribution of those kind of things, yeah. Final question. Can you improve these convergence uh, rates by imposing a different covariance structure onto, you know, maybe let's say the covariance would go to zero faster, let's say decay exponentially as the distance between two neurons increases, like in the einstein ullenbeck uh, processes? Well, so... so the distance between two neurons. So, so, so somehow the issue is that you know, there's no natural distance between neurons. It's, it's, not like, you know, it's not like the neurons are naturally a discretization of a spatial parameter. They're kind of completely exchangeable. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, it's, it's not clear how to set that up. There are other kinds of neural networks, like convolutional neural networks or something like that, in which there is a natural spatial discretization. And, and th most of these theorems have analogs in that kind of context. And then there's interesting questions of how quickly the various Fourier modes decay and all of this. Yeah, so. Yep. So uh, the results from today, um, do they shed some light on the four big questions yesterday? So, so, so I, th I think the answer is yes. In the sense that the first question was, why were you able to fit the training data? You optimize a non-convex function seemed kind of hard to believe. And the answer from this world is, actually, as the network becomes wider and wider, your function does become close to convex. Because you're basically something like a quadratic likelihood and a linear model. And so, so that's something. And these results, in fact, say you can fit anything. You can fit noise. You can fit anything you like if your model is big enough, which is consistent with what people find in practice. Um, what this doesn't shed anything, any results on is like anything about feature learning or what kind of adaptation to the data that you have. You need to have different limits and different regimes. I'll talk about that tomorrow and on Thursday. Um, so, but it, it, from my point of view, it's kind of like, I think like a, like a physicist, like a kind of mini, maybe like an n-body problem physicist or something. You know, you take a limit and then you do perturbation theory around the limit. So here we took the width to infinity, and you ask, what are the finite size corrections? And what you find is that those finite size corrections, when you actually ask how they scale with respect to the depth and the number of training data points and all that, they push you away from this Gaussian process limit. So, so in this way, you know that your perturbation theory breaks down, and you have to take a different scaling limit. And so, so, so it's, but it's kind of like the simplest degeneration of your model that you can have, and it's kind of the starting point for a lot of the analysis people, people find interesting. Yeah. So why, why do we need neural networks if in the end it becomes just linear? So, so if all you want to do, so, so, okay, two things. A, it might actually be more efficient to train this neural network on a computer than to run your Gaussian process regression if you're in very high dimensions and you have a lot of samples. So this can actually be an efficient way to implement Gaussian process regression or something like that. But, but B, the whole point is, there are many, anything you do when you're not at strict infinite width is going to differ from this Gaussian process limit and you will learn features. And so, so, so the point is, you don't want to take the width to infinity. That's like the wrong limit to study mathematically if you want to explain what happens in practice. You need to do something else, like scale the data set size and the width together, or the input dimension and the data set size and the width, or the input dimension and the data set size and the width and the depth together. Any of those limits where all of them grow will give you totally different nonlinear models. But let's like, this is the unique model which is easy to write down, but which is the one that doesn't capture any nonlinear behavior. Yeah. Maybe one question in the, in the same sense in which maybe Ivan was asking, but much more trivial maybe. 
uh, what is, is there a connection between the kind of prediction that a neural network does yeah. versus a, another, uh, the, uh, you could use another high dimensional model like a, a lasso model. Or yeah. if, if, we, if we did a prediction using a network, yes. and if we did the same prediction using one of these other yes. high dimensional regression uh, techniques, is there a connection between the two? Is there something? I mean, would, well, in, in, in this regime, yes, only because a neural network is just a linear model. But in general, we don't know how to connect the two. I mean, so there are some very specific settings where you can show that they do provably different things, but they're like very concrete, you know, special cases. But in general, we don't know how to compare them. So there is no, in the, in the entire neural network architecture, the model is, or whatever, the system is very, Highly parameterized. You have a lot, lot more parameters than the number of data inside it. Yes. Yes. There, it, and, and there is no explicit regularization. There is no. no explicit penalty for over parameterization. And yet it gives you a very sensible, uh, provided you do things correctly, a very sensible uh, prediction. No, but, but that is, so th that was the point I was trying to make yesterday. That is, the, doing things sensibly is your regularizer. Like by saying you start in a particular part of the function space and you use a greedy optimizer, you know, you, you are regularizing. It's just not clear how for a human should discuss the regularization. That, that's kind of like a, what a lot of people try to understand. I try to understand that too. Yeah. Is there any way of penalizing? What, what happens if you impose the penalty on your Is there any way of doing So people do that all the time in practice. I mean, you can add an L2 penalty, an L1 penalty. You can add any other penalty you want that's differentiable. You know, the computer will differentiate through anything. And you know, that can sometimes help or hurt performance, but it generally doesn't make or break whether you have a sensible answer. You know, you can increase your performance a little bit by regularizing a bit. So even in this system, you add a penalty, an L2 penalty for Sure. And you will essentially, the penalty won't matter. Well, I mean, if you work at Google and a 5% increase in performance is very important to you, it will certainly matter. But if your goal is to explain why things work rather than don't work, it won't matter. You know, that, that's kind of, that's what I would say. So, so it, is, it is important. It makes a substantive difference. But it's not like you didn't do better than random versus like you got state of the art. It's not like that. So let me, let, me, let me advertise for one second the lecture for tomorrow. I think it's going to be even more fun. Hopefully even more is a reasonable characterization than the lecture today. Because I understand much less the material I'll be covering tomorrow. So there will be more chance to attack me. So which is, of course, the fun part of attending lectures, right? Um, yeah. That's all I'll say.